her generation is the first generation that does not have to fear Alzheimer's. We can pretty much prevent it or do early reversals in just about everyone. So, Dr. Dale Bredesen, I am so excited to have you here today. I've been really looking forward to this interview together. We were just talking um, offline a moment ago about how prevalent Alzheimer's disease is and the incredible work that you're doing. Um, I think probably the best place to start for everyone listening is to explain the difference between Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia um, and, and really what it is. Yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, just to back up to what you said a minute ago, um, you know, everyone is talking about anti-aging now. And, and of course, you talk about high performance. Uh, but, you know, if you if, if someone's going to live to 120 or 140 and spend half that time in a nursing home with dementia, um, it, it really does not help. So we want to make it so that we reduce the global burden of dementia. Uh, and, you know, it is really striking uh, how common this problem is. And as you mentioned, there is a distinction between Alzheimer's and dementia. So dementia simply means global cognitive decline. So often you start with the memory problems, but not always. Um, there can be problems with calculation or problems with visual perception and recognition or problems with word finding or problems with navigation, things like that, that can also happen. But it it progresses over the years and you end up with a point where you cannot take care of yourself and ultimately pass away. And it's it's a horrible thing to see. And of course, it doesn't just ruin the patients, it ruins the families. Uh, very common. So in the US, for example, over 1 million people have now died from COVID-19. Uh, of the currently living Americans, about 45 million of us will die of Alzheimer's disease. So it's incredibly common. Uh, and actually in the UK, um, it has become the leading cause of death. In the last year it was the leading cause of death in women, second in men. So it is extremely common uh, and, and a big problem. Now, the difference is Alzheimer's is a pathology. So you have to have the plaques and the tangles that the pathologists have associated with Alzheimer's disease. Now, that they start early. And that's actually one of the most important things to understand, that by the time you get diagnosed, it's typically been going on for an average of 20 years. And that's been published repeatedly. So what happens is you go through four phases. You have an asymptomatic phase where you already are beginning to make those plaques and tangles, but you're still able to interact and do everything. You know, that's the, the great time to catch it and, and get on treatment. Then the second, if you don't do anything at that time, you have about a 10 year window where you have what's called SCI, subjective cognitive impairment. You know that things aren't right. You're just not quite able to do what you did before. Often the doctor will say, oh, Angela, that's just, you know, you're just uh, got some uh, this normal aging, uh, which is very unfortunate. Um, and during that time, you're still able to score normally on cognitive tests. But that is still part of Alzheimer's disease. Now, the third part is called MCI, mild cognitive impairment where now you're actually not scoring normally on cognitive testing. And each year that you have MCI, you have a five to 10% chance of now converting to the fourth and final phase, which is dementia. By definition, dementia means you've now actually begun to lose the activities of daily living. So you may have trouble balancing your checkbook and you may have trouble uh, making sure that you, you, you stay in good shape, um, you are taking care of yourself. Uh, you know, going to the bathroom, showering, things like that are, have begun to be lost. And of course, as you know, unfortunately, you end up in a point where you can't care for yourself at all. Um, so those are the four, uh, those are the four phases that you go through. And if we would just get people to get on active prevention or early treatment, we could truly make Alzheimer's a rare disease, which is what it should be. So what I've been arguing is, you know, your generation uh, is the first generation uh, that does not have to fear Alzheimer's. Uh, we have we have two daughters, my wife and I, um, who are both in their thirties. Um, they, they are they are part of that first generation that really doesn't have to worry about this because we now understand it much better than we did even a decade ago, and we can pretty much prevent it or do early reversals in just about everyone. In our clinical trial that we published last year, it's it's freely available online. 
84% of the people got better, even though we waited to treat them into the third and fourth when they got diagnosed. It was the third and fourth phase. What we're trying to do is push the world to get into the first two where you get on active prevention or earliest treatment, which is much, much easier to do. Super interesting. I mean, I guess my question, we were t- we were talking offline. I mentioned to you um, previously that my mother had just been diagnosed. And I think in a way mm-hmm. it's kind of um, helpful. It's very, very sad. And I find the whole thing extremely emotional. But I think having that experience, helping people to understand, I wish I could have seen it in my mum earlier. And I think mm-hmm. that there were some signs. And I wonder if I just share some of those. It might help other people who, because when when we, when we uh, were chatting, we talked about the fact that I think what's most helpful is, first of all, for us to tackle what people can do if they know someone with dementia and what they can do to help and using yeah. your RICO protocol. And then yeah. um, later we'll come on to how we can actually prevent it. And so if yeah. I look at my, my own experience with my mum, there were signs along the way but I didn't realize it was dementia um, until she was diagnosed and she's 81. Um, Yeah. A really big problem, isn't it? And then, and what I noticed is the time it got diagnosed by the medical system is the point at which my mom lost her speech. So she couldn't, I not entirely, but she can't speak properly anymore. Um, And she finds that word retrieval you were mentioning very, very difficult. And it was heartbreaking to see because it was not long after my father passed away last year that it seemed to hugely accelerate what was going on. But when I look back, there were some things that I noticed that I observed along the way that were unusual in my mum. So she did used to, you know, I think kind of 20 years ago, she would forget some appointments and things like that. But I also then more recently, I would say maybe 10 years ago, noticed an irritability that wasn't there my mom's like the sweetest most loving person but all of a sudden at certain times her tolerance level with my children when they were young seemed very different and I remember thinking it could this be it and I wonder if you could help people understand what are the early symptoms that we could look at if we have family members so that we can dive in earlier right and use your protocol to reverse it yeah that's such a good point and you know what you're describing is a very typical story. Now, I don't know if they've diagnosed her with primary progressive aphasia, which is one of the non-amnestic presentations of Alzheimer's disease. About two thirds of the people will present with memory problems as the big issue, but a third will have problems, as I mentioned earlier, with calculation, visual perception. And one of them is where they have, they lose their words. So they have literally have aphasia. It is primary progressive aphasia, which unfortunately you know, is part of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and so yeah, th- this is you know maybe the most important issue because look what happened when people started doing pap smears. They changed cervical cancer from a horrible disease that actually killed a lot of people to something that it ver- it kills very few people now because you can see it coming early. Look what happened with chest X-rays, and now they've got of course the the uh, low dose uh, uh, CT scans. Picking things up early makes all the difference. And again, we we do see people even in late stages where we get some improvement, but they don't tend to come all the way back to normal. Whereas the early stages, we can bring people all the way back to normal. And we just have finished a paper on people who have sustained their improvement for over 10 years, which is unheard of. That's not been reported before. So now that we understand more about what's driving this problem, there's so much more that can be done. So as you indicated, there are these early symptoms. It's interesting. One one Alzheimer's expert said to me, everybody has SCI. You know, everybody who's 50 or over has subjective cognitive impairment. No, everybody knows some sharp people who are 80, 90, even 100 sometimes. Um, it absolutely happens. But what, what happens in this is that you have these early symptoms. And what it's showing you is it's showing you that your brain has changed fundamentally. Your brain, interestingly, has, uh, and it's kind of a microcosm of what your body does, but with all this complexity in your brain, it has two major modes, just as it has sleep and awake. There are two major modes. One is connection, and that's your what you're doing every day. You're making new connections. You're making new memories. Everything you're doing is being taken in. And then, of course, you're getting rid of the stuff that's not important, and you're keeping the things that are important. So you're remembering 
where your keys are and you're remembering what you're going to do tomorrow and your plans for the future, all this sort of stuff. But what happens is your brain has a second mode, which goes, you now go from connection to protection. So you have a protective mode, which happens when you have invasion of your brain with pathogens. And this is something that has been surprising. These can come from your oral microbiome. They can come from your sinuses. They can come from a tick bite. They can come from a viral infection. Of course, as you know, COVID-19 has been shown to increase risk for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so anything that your body perceives as an insult, and that can be stress in your life, um, it, it's uh, inflammation, it's reduction in blood flow, reduction in oxygenation, all of these things, when your brain perceives that there is an insult, it switches into a protective mode and it changes, literally changes its signaling. And so what we now see is it makes the amyloid that we've always associated with Alzheimer's. The amyloid that's been vilified by the drug companies say, oh, this is what causes it. No, this is part of it, yes, but it's part of the response to these various insults. So what do you see? The brain changes in its activity. You now have trouble often with learning new things. And so when people are saying, you know, I've misplaced my keys, and you start to see that a couple of times, uh, unfortunately, the doctors say, oh, it's probably not Alzheimer's. Well, yeah, because they don't have anything to offer for Alzheimer's. You want to go the other direction. Hey, if there's something that is atypical for you, something that has changed, please get evaluated. Look, if you get evaluated and it's not Alzheimer's, hallelujah. But you still want to understand why is my memory not what it was two years ago, five years ago? And most of us who are doing the right things and not having these various insults should keep very good memories for the vast majority of our lives. So one thing is misplacing your keys and things like that. You mentioned people get flustered. And so uh, th that's another common one. So you have, oh, something is not quite right. Um, and and, then, and she, she was recognizing your mother that she couldn't deal with things the way that she did before. And that's another common one is getting flustered. Um, and then yes, word finding and uh, sudden not, not recognizing faces. That's a common one, you know, coming to see someone that, you know, you thought you knew. And another common one is you're driving and suddenly you're not sure, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm in a, I'm in a neighborhood, but which, which way do I go? So these are the sorts of things that tend to be early. Mm, interesting. And, um, when you look at like, if you have someone that's gone through the stage, you're saying with stage three and stage four, you can see yeah. a bit of a reversal, but not when someone's kind of lost, like, for example, my mom, she's lost her speech largely is at that point, has it gone so far? Has those, have those changes in the brain deteriorated to such a degree that now reversal is difficult or can you introduce your protocol at any stage? Yeah, so we've had people um, with MOCA scores, that's Montreal Cognitive Assessment, of zero. This, this is a, a scale that goes from zero to 30. So, you know, when you have an, an, even MCI, you're typically in the high teens to the 20s. So you're, you know, you may be 18 to 25-ish, that sort of thing. We see people who are in end stage who will improve. But what they get back is the ability to speak, the ability to be continent, the ability to interact with other people um, and the ability to dress themselves and things like that. They don't come back to all the way. That's what we're working on. We'd like to understand how can we bring someone from zero to 30? Does it take stem cells? Does it take intranasal trophic factors? We don't know yet. So it's important to understand that, that there are two distinct issues in Alzheimer's. One is the underlying process that's actually driving your cognition downhill. And that is essentially, as I said, it's a response to these insults. It is a chronic innate encephalitis. And what I mean by that is it's long-term, of course, uh, chronic, but it is mostly your innate immune system, not the adaptive part. The adaptive part of the immune system is the specific part that goes after the COVID-19 or goes after a, your pneumococcal pneumonia, that sort of thing. The innate part is the inflammatory part. It's the early actors. And what happens is these people get some mild inflammation that just continues in your brain for years. So as you know, we've been told that when you die of, of COVID, 
you die of cytokine storm. Your body just has this massive response, which is tremendous amount of inflammation, which unfortunately leads to damage, and you die of cytokine storm. In Alzheimer's, you die of cytokine drizzle. Instead of that storm, it's just drizzling along a little bit like mm. London. Just keeps going, drizzling, drizzling <laughs> for years and, years and years and years. Yeah, so... <laughs> So you've got this, you know, the, that that's the problem. So what we have to figure out then is we have to understand why is that there? And so the two major, the two dominant things that drive this process are reduction in energetics, that's blood flow, oxygenation, which by the way is why so many people with sleep apnea have cognitive problems. Um, it's mitochondrial function. Again, mitochondrial function, if you're gonna have high performance, you better get your mitochondrial function uh, at the best. You don't want it to be in that, you know, we're now protecting ourselves and this is now, uh, we're dealing with, with microbes and things like that. And then finally, interestingly, ketone level. So you need, your brain only burns two different things for substrates, for energy. It burns glucose and it burns ketones. Now here's what's interesting. We're all able to burn both of those when we're young. What happens then is as we become insulin resistant, which unfortunately can happen because of a poor diet, uh, too many uh, simple carbs, too much sugar, um, as uh, Professor Rick Johnson from University of Colorado has shown elegantly in his work over the years, um, this also happens because of too much fructose. Fructose actually signals to your body, winter is coming lower your energy. You, you don't want to expend your energy. You want to save it. You want to make fat because you're going to now winter. And unfortunately for Alzheimer's patients, that makes things much worse. So what happens is we lose both the ability to utilize glucose and the ability to make and utilize ketones. And this happens for people even in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. You know, as, as a neurologist, when I was training, we always thought that Alzheimer's was a disease of your 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. It's turned out to be a disease of your 30s, 40s, and 50s that just gets diagnosed 20 years later, unfortunately. So in the future, we all need to get a, what we call a cognoscopy, find out where you stand, make sure that you never progress to those later stages. And then we'll have people, you know, no problem of being able to deal with this. So it's energetics. And the other one, as I mentioned earlier, inflammation. That is a huge issue. And so what happens is you have a supply and demand for your brain. Now, as I mentioned, you have to distinguish between what's causing it, these contributors, and what causes the symptoms. The symptoms are because you have lost members of this remarkable supercomputing neural network that you have in your brain. So what happens is there's a process that you don't realize is going on in the background until it's now caused the lock, loss of these synapses. So for a while, you know, you're doing pretty well, but, and, and, but ultimately you lose enough synapses and now you're not able to do these. So then as long as you continue to lose those synapses, you're gonna continue to go downhill. We want to then bring these back online, but that requires improving the energetics, reducing the inflammation. As now, to come back to what you said earlier, if you've lost so many of these, now it's like, how, okay, you've turned off the process. So we can definitely stop it in its, uh, in its tracks. We see it all the time. But it, then it's turning it back up and getting things back. It's easier to bring them back when it's earlier. It's harder to bring them back when it's later. This is why I, I don't like the term mild cognitive impairment because it's the mm -hmm. third of four stages. It's like telling someone, please don't worry, you only have mildly metastatic cancer. Metastatic cancer is a late stage of cancer. So we want to get people come in earlier, get on active prevention or at the at SCI stage. Now in our trial, 84% of the people at the MCI stage turned around. So that was great. But some of them improved, but didn't come all the way back to normal. We, As I say, we do see it um, at the dementia stage, but it's not complete. So it's those early stages where you can get a complete reversal. The later stages, you can get a partial reversal. Interesting. You mentioned a few things there that I wanted to pick up on, both in terms of prevention and reversal. You're yeah. talking about mitochondrial health and inflammation, um, and also oxygenation and blood flow, will modalities for the biohackers listening, like 
red light therapy and hyperbaric oxygen work. I know there's a new device actually by a scientist here in the UK, I think, where it's a red light therapy device that is going across the brain and also one across the gut to enhance the gut brain access. Um, will things like this, are they good from a prevention point of view? Are they good for a treatment prevent uh, point of view? Yeah, great point. And here's the thing. So everyone is trying to sell you their device, right? Everyone, oh, this helps, this mm. helps, this helps. Thank and you. the answer is yes, many of these have impacts. So think about it this way. You have this amazing network. You have about 500 trillion connections in your brain, synapses in your brain. And you're beginning to lose those now as you go through this. And you can actually, of course, see the brain atrophy in a very, in a very macro way where all these synapses are lost, you're, you're losing that neural architecture, especially in certain areas of the brain, like the hippocampus, for example, which is so critical for learning and memory. And so what happens is you start to lose these. Uh, and when you you now, this network is, is kind of falling apart. that has got all these different things. So as I mentioned, energetics, inflammation, and then many pieces of all these. If you've changed your oral microbiome, if you've got some sinusitis, we see this all the time. If you have undiagnosed sleep apnea, all these things are contributing to that. So people will then say, well, use my red light therapy or, or you know, heal your gut or do this or do that. Yes, they're all helpful, but it's not that, you know, people will say, well, you just put this crystal on your forehead and you're, everything's going to be fine. There is a lot of junk science out there. So you have to be careful. Mm. And the reality is for many of these, first of all, talk to people who've done it. Did it help them? See if there are things published on it. That's very helpful. And then try it for a short period. Say, look, you know, if this really works, I'm happy to, to use it, but, uh, you know, give me a couple of weeks to try it out, something like that. Because what you'll find is there are going to be people where the rate limiting step is related to, for example, red light. And it's, we all get exposed to way too much blue light, you know, at night and that's contributing, for example, to macular degeneration. So I, I think certainly, you know, red, red light is helpful for that as well. And there was actually a nice study on, on uh, age-related visual loss being helped by red light therapy. So there's no question there are roles for all these things. I particularly like one called EWOT, which is exercise with oxygen therapy, because what it does is it drives, now you're driving your cerebral blood flow and you're driving the oxygenation together. And we see people get dramatic improvements. And again, people have had this old notion that, well, we just don't know what causes Alzheimer's. So we just, you know, we don't know what to do about it. Well, now we do understand much more about what is driving this process. And I should mention a, a very well-known scientist, uh, Dr. Lee Hood has just come out with an excellent book along with, uh, with, uh, uh, with Nathan Price, uh, his protege, um, in which they looked at large data sets uh, using AI and came up with the same thing, that yes, Alzheimer's is driven by a reduction in energetic support. So as you can imagine, as you become insulin resistant, now you don't metabolize the glucose as well. Uh, you, you actually can measure changes in biochemistry in the signaling from the insulin receptor, a molecule called IRS1, which changes its phosphorylation pattern when you go into this insulin resistance state. And in fact, beautiful work uh, showing that you can actually pick this up in the blood in exosomes to show that there's been a change in this signaling in the brain. Um, and so you see these changes in insulin resistance. But unfortunately, as long as your insulin stays high, so your body is now having to pump out more insulin to get the same effect because you are insulin resistant. As long as that insulin's high, your body cannot make ketones. So now you go into this starvation state just from, uh, you know, just from fasting and your body would normally produce ketones during that time, very good for your brain. But guess what? You now can't make the ketones. So when we see patients who are having cognitive decline, we consider this an energetic emergency. Um, they're typically not able to metabolize glucose normally, and they're typically not able to make ketones. So in fact, Professor Stephen Kinane uh, from Canada has done a beautiful study where he simply gave people with mild cognitive impairment, that's the third stage, he simply gave them ketones and they improve their cognition. So people will say, well, each of these things is not a cure. Exactly. 
It's not that simple. It's not one little thing. People have said, oh, it's just about misfolded proteins. Oh, it's just about a prion. Oh, it's just about this, that, or the other. No, this is about a network insufficiency. And you've driven that by this chronic innate encephalitis. So you want to get rid of the drivers and then you want to rebuild the network. And it's not simple, but each of these things that you're mentioning plays a role. And by the way, this is why high performance is so important because you are optimizing your mitochondria, because you are optimizing your cerebral blood flow, because you're optimizing your oxygenation. We recommend that everybody get evaluated for their nocturnal oxygen saturation. Um, I think wearables, again, for, especially for the younger generations, but for all of us, wearables, I, mean, I, I like to wear an Apple watch, but some people like Garmin and some people like to wear- Yeah, I use the Aura uh, ring. Aura ring, yes. And which our measures my board. oxygen, yeah. Perfect. And, and the thing is, you know, this is the future. We will all see these chronic illnesses coming years ahead when your HRV, your heart rate variability is now going down, when your oxygenation is now going down, you can pick it up. The problem with chronic illnesses like Alzheimer's is that by the time you get symptoms, it's relatively late in the disease process. So picking this up early with wearables and they're going to get better and better and better. I mean, look what we can now do. You can you can check your telomere length. You can check your, your microbiome. You can check your heart rate variability. You can check your oxygenation. Just on and on. It's really fantastic. Yeah, it's really amazing. Really amazing. I want to touch there because you were mentioning on like recovery and HRV and things like that to touch on sleep because it's it's really relevant. And we we were talking before we began the interview that I'm pretty jet lagged. I've just come back yeah. from you know, South Asia. And so it's kind of a five and a half hour time difference. So I didn't sleep well last night. And I'm going to be honest, I'm having to work quite hard. I have done all day, sometimes to find the words, right? Normally, everything's really, really fluid. I find it really easy. Um, and I think what is happening there, because even on one poor night's sleep, right, I find that the connections, they just, they don't seem to quite work as fast. I can't find things quite as quickly. And I'm curious as to how much, what A, what's happening and B, how much sleep plays a part? Because I think that the recommendations you see are always that you should sleep seven to nine hours. Then yeah. when I've looked at kind of DNA testing, for example, it seems that some people have a slightly higher sleep need of an over nine hours. Some people like myself came out to have a lower sleep need. And I've noticed that I pretty much will sleep for six and a half hours. It's quite difficult regardless to get me to sleep more, but I work on the quality. So I'm curious um, because I think a lot of people listening will wonder how much do I need to prioritize sleep and do I need to get to a certain amount or quality, et cetera, to protect my brain? Yeah, such a good point. So if you look at the things that, again, that, that drive the, the support for your brain and that are inhibitory of the development of dementia, there are seven basics, diet, exercise, sleep, stress, brain training, detox, and some targeted supplements. Those are the basics. So as you mentioned, sleep is one of the most important. Uh, pr uh, Professor Matthew Walker, right over here in Berkeley, has written a beautiful book called Why We Sleep. V very helpful. And as you said, the targets, just to get the details there, the targets are seven to eight hours or even nine, but not you don't really want more than that. But seven, to eight is good. Uh, hours and you want to have at least an hour and a half of REM sleep and you want to have at least uh, 60 minutes uh, of deep sleep because that's very helpful for detox. So you can track it on whatever wearable you like to have. And what this does is it actually reduces the amyloid that we associate with Alzheimer's disease. And the amyloid really comes back to being part of the innate immune system. It is what your brain makes when it sees various microbes and actually uh, two professors from Harvard, uh, Rudy Tanzi and Robert Moyer, several years ago showed that amyloid is an antimicrobial peptide. So it is part of the innate immune system. You reduce that when you sleep. And again, people say, well, this is what causes Alzheimer's. Well, it's a mediator of this downsizing protective response, but it's not what causes Alzheimer's, except in the rare situations where someone has a mutation in the gene, which is a, about one in a thousand or so people with Alzheimer's disease. So very uncommon. So the reality is sleep is one of the ways that you stay sharp, that you improve your 
uh, processing speed. I mean, you're, you're, as you say, you're noticing it. Your processing speed isn't quite what it, what it was a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. And so how much sleep do you need? Well, you need the amount that keeps you sharp. And as you said, some people do just fine with six hours. There are people even who say, look, five hours, I'm sharp. Um, you know, it, it's, it's not always clear that they're correct. They, they may just may not be operating, at, you know, at, at optimal uh, speed. But for most people, you're going to want to be in that seven to eight hour range for sleep. And you're going to want to have that hour and a half of REM and an hour of, of deep sleep to get yourself to have a functional brain that works the best. And we have a number of people with cognitive decline. Literally, when they get good sleep, they're sharp. When they don't get good sleep, they really drop off. And so as the brain's struggling to maintain, as you're, you know, as you're losing that synapse count and you're continuing that mild chronic innate encephalitis, um, you are having, you're, you're kind of on the edge. And so you can see things that pe make people better and worse because they're kind of always operating right on that edge. So no question, sleep is good. And, and you know, when you change time zones, um, you know, consider using some melatonin. Uh, a chronobiologist pointed out to me at one point that, you know, if you're going to go east with your travel, then you're going to want to get out early in the morning so that you've got to get you, you want to get those sun's rays to re-instruct your brain, to reset your brain. On the other hand, when you're going west, you want to go out late in the day to get those rays because you want to tell your brain, okay, when it used to be dark, now it's going to be light. I'm changing my chronobiology here. Uh, but no question, it is it is a stress to do this. And then boom, you, you get in late and you're working the next day. Mm, yeah, no, it is definitely. I mean, I think it's interesting what you say there about REM and deep sleep, because I've noticed even though my sleep is shorter, I'm very efficient with it and I get high amounts of deep and REM. And maybe that's why I normally feel sharp. Is that yeah. light sleep? Um, you know, obviously that also impacts the brain. Is there is so the duration you're saying kind of is more individual, right? But we definitely want to hit those metrics if we're tracking to protect our brains. Exactly. Okay, interesting. Um what about sleep positioning? So does the blood flow affect if someone's sleeping flatter? You know, a lot of people, they might raise their mattress, for example, if they've got digestive issues and things like yeah. that. Does it matter? Do you need to be completely flat to encourage more blood flow or sleeping so, on a side or? Yeah, this is such a good point because there is a lot written about this. So there, there's one paper that concluded that if you sleep on your right side, you're better. There's another paper that concluded <laughs> if you sleep on your left side, you're better. You know, uh, you know, so there, there, unfortunately, there is no consensus that this is the thing that does the best. Here, here are the, the, the main points. If you have reflux, which is common, uh, especially in people over 40, uh, and especially, you know, again, based on your diet as well, um, then you're, you're probably not going to want to sleep flat. Uh, so you, as you said, you know, often put things up just a little bit. And that seems to be okay. But the issue here is if you do sleep flat, if you get that GERD, that reflux, it can actually cause an esophagitis. And unfortunately, that esophagitis then, is, there's a part of the esophagus that is within a couple of millimeters of the left atrium of the heart. So there was a surprising study actually done out of EU that showed that people who develop atrial fibrillation, if they just took antacids for their, and you know, uh, not just antacids, but uh, uh, proton pump inhibitors or H2 blockers. So these are the ways to get at this reflux. 28% um, of these people lost their atrial fibrillation. I mean, that's how striking and how common this is as a problem. And by the way, atrial fibrillation, a uh, relatively common thing, and it's a, an important contributor to cognitive decline because not only does it reduce your blood flow, uh, and, and does reduce by about 10% or so. So there is a definite effect on blood flow. Um, but it also, of course, can lead to repeated clotting. So you now can send microthrombi and even macrothrombi and have strokes and things like that. So um, it is something to think about and to, and to deal with, again, to, to optimize things. Uh, and then the, uh, as far as you know, which side to lie on, Try it. You know, see see for yourself. And again, the good news is you can find out what did my SpO2 do last night. The big problem with with lying on your back is that there are many people who will drop their jaws back 
and then develop some sleep apnea when they sleep on their backs, but that's taken care of to simply sleep on your side. Mm -hmm. So for anyone who's at risk for sleep apnea or for anyone who is a snorer, I mean, most, most snorers already know sleep on your side, you'll quit snoring. Uh, and so that's an important thing to know. But again, a uh, good idea to have a sleep study. It has been estimated that 80% of people who have sleep apnea do not get diagnosed. So it's it's diagnosed in a minority of people. And it can be important for things like cognitive decline. And we see it all the time where people will have sleep apnea. They don't realize it. In fact, well, one of the first people who got on our protocol years ago went six years doing beautifully. Her MOCA score went from 24 to a perfect 30. Much She's a professor of nursing, and she's actually in a book uh, that where seven people talked about it called The First Survivors of Alzheimer's and wrote their stories. And I, I uh, challenge people to read these stories without getting a bit choked up about it, to read these people who were told they were going to die and then who came back and did, it did very well is, is really striking. So she then, after six years, started to have some decline. And we thought, you know, this is a secondary decline. What happened here? And she had, you know, amyloid PET proven, APOE4 positive, which is the common gene associated. She had classical uh, Alzheimer's at the MCI stage. And she then started going downhill again. And so it turned out that she had undiagnosed severe sleep apnea was one of the things. She also had new exposure. Her house had developed a leak. She had new exposure to toxins made by molds, which unfortunately, another way to induce your body to have an inflammatory response, mm. a relatively common one. And then she also turned out to have a chronic mild sinusitis due to an unknown uh, or an, uh, an, an uncommon organism that's called Cryptococcus laurentii. When those three things were treated, boom, right back to where she was. And she's done very, very well. So uh, sleeping is an important part of optimal cognition. Mm, really important. I wanted to pick up on that um, around what you said, uh, the proton pump inhibitors and atrial fibrillation. If yeah. somebody is taking uh, antacids or proton pump inhibitors, that can affect obviously the acidity of their stomach and things like B vitamins, which I think are a really important part of your protocol. What would yes. you say there? Is it then a case of taking the medication and compensating for all that through supplementation? Yeah, you also reduce things like uh, B12 and zinc and things mm. like that. So yeah, it can be a problem. The other thing is it's the acid that closes your lowest lower esophageal sphincter. So you do better with reflux if you've got the acid there. So what a lot of people are experiencing when they now have this reflux is they're no longer able to make the acid. So unfortunately, the pharmacological approach is just, okay, let's get rid of the acid that's there. Well, that opens things up even more. So you get more, ultimately you get more reflux. And so people of course become dependent on these things. So the idea here is first see if you have enough acid in your stomach, uh, because that's going to be a more physiological way. You know, the, the entire field of medicine in the 21st century is moving from the old fashioned way, which I learned back in the 1970s and 80s, where you just, you know, it's a knee jerk. You have problems, you give this, you know, acid, give, you know, give, give an antacid, you know, reflux, mm -hmm. you give an antacid, uh, you know, you have hypertension, you don't ask why, you just give an, an antihypertensive. This is now outdated medicine. We now are, are asking instead of what is the diagnosis, we're asking why, why did you get this problem? It needs to be a more physiological approach to human existence, to health, to performance, all of these things are critical. And so instead of just giving the H2 blockers or the PPIs, which PPIs in some, time, in some cases have been associated uh, with increased risk for neurodegenerative diseases such as ALS and, and cognitive decline. So be careful, minimize them. But instead, go after what's the physiology. For some people, it's cured just by improving the acid. So they'll take betaine HCL. In some people, it's, in, in, it's cured simply by taking uh, some digestive enzymes so that you can now digest the, the proteins and the fats better than without, and you get much less of that reflux then. So again, for all of these things, and that includes cognitive decline, go after the physiology. How does this work normally? How were we evolved to act as human beings, to act as hominids, rather than just a knee-jerk, 
give this medicine, which is often very anti-physiological. Mm, very much so. One thing I, I, not everyone wants to listen to this, I suppose, depending on where they are, if they want to enjoy a glass of wine. When I found out I had the APOE4 gene, and obviously now I've gone on to learn that that is expressed in my family, clearly through my mum, um, yeah. I gave up alcohol. Actually, it was actually as a, a kind of experiment initially on things. And then now I'm sort of approaching, I think it's close to 500 days of not having drank any alcohol wow. at all. Wow. And that, that for me was prompted that after I did this challenge, which started as 90 days and then turned into a 12 month challenge, I heard Dr. Rhonda Patrick talking about some research around APOE4 and saying, that if you carry that gene, no amount of alcohol is safe. It would become very difficult for me to consider enjoying a glass of wine with that knowledge. Um, and, you know, I'm just curious, you you being the expert on this, what are, what are your views around alcohol? Yeah. So, you know, one of the people we work with, who, by the way, has done well for over 10 years, she had, had gotten to the 35th percentile um, on her cognitive testing, was really struggling, has two copies of APOE4, uh, and has people in her family dying of Alzheimer's. Um, and she she got her symptoms in her late 40s. Um, she's now 60. She's doing absolutely great. Um, and, and and this is Julie G. And she founded the website uh, apoe4.info and, and people share their information there. So she uh, she minimizes hers, but she will drink some sometimes. So yeah, as long as it's not hurting you, as long as you're not having changes in your cognition, it's not the end of the world. And of course, actually, Rhonda has been here and I had an interview with her a few years ago. Um, and and she's you know a wonderful scientist and 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 doing you know doing a lot of the right things. Um, so for her, the argument is let's have zero. Uh, my wife deals with this same issue, although she's APOE4 negative, but um, her father um, had Lewy body dementia, uh, and so um, and so she's very aware of this. She's an integrative physician, and she does uh, have uh, typically it's one or one and a half glasses a couple times a week. Uh, it may be once a week. It may be a couple times a week, not to the point where it's actually making you, uh, you know, making you tipsy. Um, but mm -hmm. you know, there there are you have to you have to remember it's not just all the bad. It also relaxes you. Um, it also um, it can actually in some cases improve your lipid status. Um, it certainly can improve uh, your you know any sort of. Uh, of stress. So it has both positives and negatives and you have to weigh those as, as opposed to just saying, you know, everything's bad. Yeah. I like that approach. <laughs> yeah. um, you mentioned ketones um, and the brain producing and also like use of ketones, exogenous ketones. Um, I guess my question would be around this. And I know you go into a lot and people can read further about this in your, in your work, in your book. Uh, or books, should I say. Um, but when we look at that, one of the things is people might be considering is if they go on a kind of higher fat diet, what is the risk with other things that they may have uh, a predisposition to like heart disease or um, like having too many saturated fats and things? How can they optimize for obviously that blood glucose control and also um, protecting themselves against cardiovascular disease, which is another kind of one of the four horsemen, right, that Dr. Peter Atia talks about alongside dementia? Yeah, yeah, it's a great point. Uh, and the reality is that yes, typically for, for many people, saturated fats are, are not a good thing. The good news is you can easily follow, you can look and there's better and better. Look at ApoB is a very inexpensive way to look at whether you have atherogenic particles. And I think that that's gonna kind of slowly replace a lot of these other things. You can also look to see whether you have you know specific inflammation, um, things like uh, myeloperoxidase and things and uh, HSCRP and things like that. So you can look to see whether you have the inflammation that that characterizes vascular disease as well. But as far as the diet, so we've looked at what is what is the thing that actually gives you the best brain function over the long haul, and it is a plant rich, mildly ketogenic diet. Yes, there are time people like carnivory. Some people like oh, I want to 100% meat. Well, for some people that have had autoimmune diseases. It actually has been helpful to them. Great. There's never been anything published to show that that it gives you long-term better cognition. Whereas plant-rich, mildly ketogenic diets not only fit theoretically because they give you the they give you both your ketones back and they give you your insulin sensitivity back. Those are the two things that you need 
for supporting your brain. So that's why we we use these. And the one that we use is called Ketoflex 12-3. People have talked a lot about Mediterranean diet. The problem there is it doesn't give you the endogenous ketosis. Uh, the mind diet, same problem. Uh, so this is why we use Ketoflex 12-3. Uh, and you and I were talking offline before uh, it, it now is available. People, Because people say, well, how do I get all these things? Um, you can get it if you're in the U.S., um, you can get it uh, uh, through uh, Nutrition for Longevity as Ketoflex 12.3. I hope it's going to be available in the U.K. Uh, soon. Uh, we've worked with, uh, we've actually done a lot of work with Nutrition for Longevity uh, and the um, and physicians. Julie G. worked on this a lot herself. Uh, she's really now an, an expert in this area. Uh, and my wife, who, as I mentioned, who's an integrative physician, uh, Dr. Aida lachine Bredesen. So uh, there, there's been a lot of work on getting this optimized. And if you're doing this, although yes, it is a high good fats, intermediate protein, low carbs and zero simple carbs diet. Um, your, your lipid profile and, and hers is a great example, uh, should be superb. Um, it's not about the fats typically, although saturated fats and trans fats, yes, that can be a problem. It is typically, it's about the simple carbs. Those are the things that drive your triglycerides to be higher. Um, they, the, the carbs actually give you, and I mentioned fructose earlier, but, but you can get into that same pathway as Professor Johnson has shown us uh, through, uh, through glucose and through salt, interestingly. Uh, so that can trigger these, this same pathway. So getting these things optimized, getting a high good fats, things like, you know, avocados and, and extra virgin olive oil and things like that, those actually turn out to be quite helpful. They have, interestingly, an anti-inflammatory effect as well. So you're getting the support and you're getting less drag on the, uh, on the immune side of things. Amazing. A um, couple of things. I'm conscious of your time. Um, one, uh, in, when we talk about anti-inflammatory, and, and just I do want to touch just very briefly on women's hormones. But first, just on the anti-inflammatory side and also the, the connective factors. I know you talk about a few different um, supplements or compounds. Ones that I've been reading about in your work is um, curcumin or turmeric and then also uh, lion's mane. And um, I wonder if you could share a bit more about those. Would you say, for example, for those thinking about prevention, that lion's mane would be something really good to introduce uh, as as a kind of everyday protocol, maybe replacing some some of the caffeine. Yes. So lion's mane actually has been shown to increase nerve growth factor, which is, a, again, supporting for your brain. I also like cat's claw. Um, which is another one um, that's been used. And this was actually shown uh, by Professor uh, uh, Rudy Tanzi uh, to decrease uh, amyloid. So again, when you're, uh, you know, it, it's not that this is just about removing amyloid. It's about reducing this storm of, or this drizzle uh, of this ongoing mild chronic inflammation. Um, and those, as you mentioned, curcumin is a very good one and there's really beautiful work uh, from Professor Greg Cole and Professor Sally Frouchy down at UCLA, uh, who, who really popularized this and published numerous studies showing that it binds to both amyloid and it binds to the tau that we associate, the phospho tau that we associate with Alzheimer's disease. Um, so it is, of course, been used in India for thousands of years. Mm. So these are helpful. But also, I like uh, to think about pregnenolone. If you're many people, as we uh, get a little older, our pregnenolone is too low. And so having your pregnenolone optimized, that is an upstream steroid um, that goes can go both to sex steroids like estradiol and progesterone, but also to the stress steroids like cortisol and things like that. And then um, not only the omega-3s, so DHA and EPA, very helpful, uh, but also resolvins, uh, some beautiful work from Professor Charles Searhan from Harvard showing that uh, the, the, there, there's a set of things that are omega-3 related called that he named resolvins. These are specialized pro-resolving mediators that help to, to quell any ongoing inflammation. Now, again, ultimately, you want to know why do you have the inflammation? Um, but the beginning, you want to start by 
getting that support up with things like ketones and getting the inflammation down. Then it buys you some time, typically nine to 12 months. During that time, you can determine, is there an infection? You know, what is it that's causing us? Is my, do I have a leaky gut? You know, leaky gut was something not even taught to me in medical school, but it's turned out to be very common. Uh, and again, uh, Professor Fasano has done beautiful work over the years to showing how common this is and how important it is for uh, things like chronic systemic inflammation. Amazing. And then um, lastly, women's women's hormones. We know that that drop oh. in estrogen is a triggering event. What what would you say? I mean, it sounds um, from from the research and from, from what I'm seeing that unless it's contraindicated, right, for some reason. Um, that a woman is at risk, it sounds like having hormone therapy is a positive. So here's a here's a patient I was just contacted about yesterday. She was 52 years old, an attorney, brilliant, um, started having problems finding words. Uh, and um, initially, interestingly, somebody gave her bioidentical hormone replacement um, and she was improved. And another doctor took it away and said, no, no, this is bad for you. This will make you worse. And of course, she ended up getting worse. She's now she's been to the most famous medical establishments in the world. I won't name them uh, where they documented very clearly that she has Alzheimer's disease and told her there's nothing that you can do. Uh, and she's then slowly come downhill and she's now 62. And the reality is um, she has a non-amnestic presentation for Alzheimer's. Um, she should have been on the BHRT from day one, and she should have also looked at when we see these non-amnestic presentations, it's typically associated with toxins. You have to do a deep dive into inorganics, organics, and into biotoxins, things like mycotoxins. When they detox, these people get better over time. And so here's someone that unfortunately has lost 10 years uh, because people just say, well, we don't know what causes Alzheimer's. This, you know, we, We're going to document that you have it, but we're not going to help you with it. So again, times are changing as we understand this better. And yes, again and again and again, bioidentical hormone replacement has been helpful uh, for people to get through menopause. And, and when you go through menopause, um, the, the changes in the PET scans showing your metabolism in the brain do mirror those of Alzheimer's. Now, in most people, as you know, they then resolve over time and you don't go on to get Alzheimer's. But unfortunately, um, in about 15 percent of the population, you do. And as you know, it's more common in women than men, uh, about two to one or so. Uh, so, you know, again, everybody should be on active prevention. If you're having any problems, if you're 40 or over active prevention, if you're having any problems, get in early. And yes, um, unfortunately, menopause, when you're now losing that support, is one of the triggers that can give you cognitive decline. Amazing. You have linked so much there. Where can people find you have you have a documentary coming out, I believe. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you there's um, a documentary on just Apple called, TV and Amazon. Yeah, which is going to be on Amazon Prime uh, by the end of uh, November. Uh, before that, it, it has a, it has a website. So which is Memories for Life, um, and this is uh, narrated by Michael Bublé, who did an absolutely great job. Uh, and uh, which was the the director was uh, Yuki Tokugawa, uh, who worked with the NHK, which is the CNN of of Japan, uh, to put this together. Uh, and interestingly, uh, they, they uh, talked to a number of the patients who did very well. And these people talk about their own stories in this and talk about um, how difficult it is to change the medical establishment to say, hey, wait a minute, there's something here that is that is working better um, than the drugs that we're giving. Um, there are also some books, as you mentioned, The End of Alzheimer's, The End of Alzheimer's Program and The First Survivors of Alzheimer's, all available, the usual places from Barnes and Noble to to uh, to Amazon to others, uh, and so and then there's you know there's a website and there's Facebook and Twitter and and the usual sort of outlets at Dr. Dale Bredesen so that you can see what we're doing on a day to day basis. We've just started a new clinical trial. Um, we're also we are just uh, establishing the first precision medicine program in the world for uh, people who have any form of neurodegenerative disease. So we need to get larger data sets. We need to bring more AI to bear on this problem so that we can address the things that are actually causing the neurodegenerative conditions. I love it. I love the work you're doing. I'm so grateful for you, to you for doing it. I just think it's transformational for people. And as you say, for people in their thirties, hopefully yeah. they can experience a world without dementia. 
Um, so I just want to say thank you and thank you for coming on the show today. We will link to all of that in the show notes. And um, I think there's also the RICO protocol is in practices, right, that you license throughout the world as well. Yeah, yeah. so there are over 2,000 people who are practicing this around the world and from 10 different countries and all over the, and all over the place. So, yes, a RICO protocol, uh, lots of excellent practitioners. So, yeah, please, you know, the performance is part of preventing decline. Um, and people often don't realize how closely those are linked. So please keep continuing to optimize performance and preventing dementia so that, uh, you know, as I said earlier, you know, your, your generation is the first that doesn't have to worry about this problem. Amazing. Thank you so much. We will link to all of that in the show notes. Thank you, Dr. Dale. Thanks, Angela. Take care. Bye.